Hi, this presentation is about diastolic heart failure. A very confused and poorly understood entity, but if you put all the jigsaw pieces into place, it's a very simple picture which you'll be able to see through this presentation. So diastolic heart failure has also been called heart failure preserved ejection fraction. The reason is that the cause of the failure in this condition is contested. Actually, in this presentation, I will suggest that we need an even better name for this. Heart failure without eccentric hypertrophy. Let me explain what I mean. To understand what is going on, you need to first start by looking at a normal ventricle. This is what we do every day. There is a patient and his echo is being done. He is lying down. It could be a normal person. It could be somebody who is having a health check before he joins the army. Or it could be somebody who has very severe angina and is NYHA class 3. What you would see is a heart which is normal in size and beating quite normally. You know that the normal stroke volume would be 70 ml. You know that the heart rate is about 72 and the resting cardiac output is about 5 liters per minute. All this we don't measure in echo but this is what happens. What we do measure is that the ejection fraction which is basically the amount ejected upon the amount contained in the ventricle and that is 65% normal. See what happens when a normal person exercises. The heart rate goes up and the contractility increases. So the numbers change. The stroke volume has gone up to 110, the heart rate has gone up to 160, the cardiac output is now 18 to 20 liters a minute and the ejection fraction at peak exercise 85%. This is a normal heart. Let's look at abnormal hearts. Now there are many diseases in which the heart size remains normal. Many patients of aortic stenosis, there is no cardiomegaly. Heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, the one that we are trying to discuss is a heart in which there is no cardiomegaly, restrictive cardiomyopathy. And the patient we just saw, a patient with severe angina and a normal sized heart. This is what happens at rest. But you know that cardiac problems are best understood when the patient exercises. And this is what happens at exercise. The heart ejection fraction does not increase. Whereas, as we just saw in normal people, the heart ejection fraction goes up. So this is the difference that is not obvious in the resting study, but would become very obvious if we were to exercise the patient. We use ejection fraction as the measure of LV function. In acute dysfunction, let's say a normal heart develops a myocardial infarction or develops an acute myocarditis, the stroke volume would decrease, the contractility would decrease and the ejection fraction would come down. So in acute dysfunction, what we do get is a quantitation of the systolic function. But see what happens in chronic dysfunction. A diseased heart with a low ejection fraction over months and years is going to try and sort things out for itself. And what it does is to grow in size. Now when we see this heart, the patient may be feeling a whole lot better. Let's say he had an anterior MI and he was having mild CHF when he was admitted. Six months down the road, you have a patient with a much bigger heart. The ejection fraction is still low. But the reason why this ejection fraction is low is now very different. It's because the denominator of the ejection fraction has increased. The LB volume has increased. So let's look at the numbers. The stroke volume was low when the patient had an infarction. It was 45. With the improvement, it is back to 70. The ejection fraction, which was 35, is not much better. What has really changed is the end diastolic volume, 
from 130 it has gone to double the size. Let's look at people with big hearts. Dilated cardiomyopathy, a big heart and a low ejection fraction, let's say 30%. And an athlete. Athletes have big hearts because of their training. They undergo compensatory enlargement. At rest, they have low ejection fractions. Both of them actually are using hypertrophy and hyperplasia to enlarge their hearts. The DCM patient to improve his exercise capacity because he is sick and the athlete for the same reason because he wants to be the fittest in the world. There is no difference when we check them at rest in an echocardiogram. But see what happens in an exercise echocardiogram. The DCM patient cannot do much better but the exercising athlete has a huge heart very capable of increasing its ejection fraction, very capable of helping him to compete effectively in sports. This huge heart does better than the normal sized heart of normal individuals like you and me. But in the resting echocardiograms, it looks a bit like dilated cardiomyopathy. Let's look at other conditions in which the heart enlarges to improve function. In patients born with shunts, in patients with regurgitations and even people who have congenital complete heart block. The heart enlarges, hypertrophies, the muscle increases, the volume of the ventricle increases and you have a heart which is beating like this. Let us say the patient go undergoes a corrective surgery. The regurgitation has been treated or the shunt has been closed. See what happens to the heart now. It's a healthy heart. The shunt has disappeared, the regurgitation has disappeared, but the size is still large when the patient is seen after the surgery. The resting ejection fraction will not be high because the stroke volume of 70 ml when the denominator is very big is going to be low. This is pseudo LV dysfunction. A large ventricle at rest will not be ejecting 50% or 60%. That would be too much blood being put into the aorta. The denominator is high. This can be understood in another story. Imagine two people falling in love. The male is much larger than the female and they exchange their hearts. So the larger heart of the male goes to the female and the female's heart which is much smaller comes to the male. The next day when you do echocardiograms it will be the male who will be doing poorly. He, his heart is too small for his body. The ejection fraction will go up and try to compensate. He will be sick but echocardiographically he will have an excellent ejection fraction better than normal. See what happens to the female who has now got a big heart. The ejection fraction at rest will be fairly low. Not because the heart is diseased. Because the heart has very little to do for a small body when it is actually designed for a much bigger body. And then what happens in a lover's exchange of hearts chronically? The girl's heart in the boy's body will keep growing to accommodate the work that has to be done. And the boy's heart in the girl is actually going to decondition. It is going to shrink in size and a year later they will both be having perfectly good looking hearts, although from genetic mapping you will see that the girl's heart has the male's chromosomes and the boy's heart has the female chromosomes. We keep on blaming diastolic function, but I think it's important to understand that in diastole the heart has very little to do apart from the adequately filled to a volume more than the stroke volume. So if the end diastolic volume of a heart failure preserved ejection fraction is adequate and it invariably is, the diastole is not causing the problem. The diastolic function is just to fill up the heart to an adequate volume. Whatever we measure in the mitral Doppler signals etc. These are related to high filling pressures. They are not really diastolic function. There is a very rare true diastolic heart failure 
If a person has tamponade, you can see that the heart cavities become compressed. The same happens in patients of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, especially when it is very severe, leading to hemodynamic compromise. Or if somebody has a large tumor in his ventricle, there will be no space for the blood. What happens? The heart compensates by contracting and ejecting most of the blood that it is able to accommodate in diastole. In true diastolic heart failure, the ventricle is small and the ejection fraction increases to compensate for the lack of blood in the ventricle. And these are rare diseases. This is not diastolic heart failure that we keep diagnosing in old people. So what I really want to say is that in chronic heart diseases, eccentric hypertrophy occurs, it increases LV mass and volume and improves systolic function. But of course we know it increases wall stress, it increases apoptosis and so people with big hats have a very bad long term prognosis. Heart failure preserved ejection fraction is heart failure of old age. Systolic function has declined with time, with hypertension, with various comorbidities. But the compensatory hypertrophy that we see in younger people does not occur. The same problem can be seen in any organ. If a healthy young person undergoes a nephrectomy, his other kidney will grow. If the same thing is done in a very aged person, let's say somebody who is 80 undergoes a nephrectomy, you will have no compensatory hypertrophy. The same thing that is happening in dilated cardiomyopathy, that the heart grows in young people, but the same muscle disease in very old people, the heart is unable to grow, is also present in our livers, in our kidneys. Let me also point out that restrictive cardiomyopathy is very similar. You have a person who's got heart muscle disease, but this heart muscle disease is not allowing the heart to grow in size and develop a compensatory eccentric hypertrophy. So basically, this stunted growth is a juvenile form of heart failure preserved ejection fraction. It's not really a restriction. Let me conclude. Heart failure preserved ejection fraction and restrictive cardiomyopathy have systolic dysfunction but no compensatory eccentric hypertrophy. They do not have diastolic heart failure. Resting EF is not a measure of systolic function in chronic conditions. It reflects increase in denominator by eccentric growth. Exercise is required for assessing systolic function. Resting measurements are inadequate for assessment. Unless you are dealing with an NYHA class 4 patient, you can't see much. Let's look at all the loose ends. We know that there are differences in response to treatment between preserved ejection fraction and reduced ejection fraction heart failures. The reason is large ventricles have decreased wall stress and apoptosis. Drugs, when they reduce LV size and wall stress in reduced ejection fraction, they improve prognosis. In an elderly with a small heart, all this is never achieved. It is an, often an end stage disease. You cannot get an improvement in the elderly unless you reduce their heart size, but their heart size is already normal. End stage HCN can show dilatation, change from failure of eccentric growth to ample LV growth. This is mentioned in the books, but this probably never happens. There can be some decrease in muscle mass in end stages, so the cavity may get scooped out and become a little larger. The ejection fraction of course can fall, but the heart cannot grow. The disease itself is preventing the heart from growing. What about all the diastolic abnormalities? I told you they are mostly just reflection of the filling pressures. What about all the stiffness that is found in diastolic heart failure ventricles? Actually, this is all neuronal activation leading to high filling pressures again. When the failure is treated, 
The patient's cardiac output improves with drugs or any other method. The stiffness of the ventricle persists. But the filling pressure is normalized because the neurohumeral activation is no longer there. Last question, should this be published in a journal? I think this view has to be examined and discussed. But it has been rejected by numerous journals for months and years. I think the reason may be that it is difficult to understand without animations. And so it's here for you on YouTube. Thanks for watching till the end. I'd love to get your comments on this. Maybe you can post it below or you can send it to me on my email address. Thank you very much.